If you're a guest with us, we want to <clears throat> once again welcome you this morning. We've been going through a study out of the uh, book of Romans, and uh, we've seen in large part that the book of Romans is about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we've looked at uh, having a passion for the gospel, the importance of preaching the gospel, the power of the gospel, uh, principles of the gospel. We, we've also seen what happens when there is the preclusion of the gospel, when the gospel is, is absent, and how that really gives birth and cultivates a godless society. And this morning, as we enter into Romans chapter 12, we're going to be talking about practicing the gospel, uh, because after all, what use is the gospel if we do not apply it to our lives, if we do not practice the things that uh, Jesus and his uh, apostles taught us. And so as we uh, take on and unpack Romans chapter 12 this morning, it's really divided into three different sections. Part one addresses spiritual sacrifice. Part two uh, addresses spiritual gifts. And part three addresses spiritual conduct. And so if you're interested in spiritual things, which is the title of our message this morning, and in which all Christians should be, this chapter highlights three distinct spiritual characteristics or virtues that every Christian should be flourishing in and growing in in regard to our relationship with God as well as our relationship to <clears throat> others. And so with that brief introduction, we pick up this morning in Romans uh, chapter 12, and we will look at uh, the first three verses, and it is in these first three verses that Paul talks about spiritual sacrifice. Again, spiritual sacrifice. Paul opens up, <clears throat> and he says, therefore, I urge you, and so there's a, a sense of urgency in Paul's heart and in Paul's mind when it comes to uh, the things that he is about to share with us in Romans chapter 12. And, you know, uh, really, in so many ways, the church lacks urgency today, doesn't it? We, we are uh, complacent. We are content. We, we are comfortable. But, but Paul, he starts off and he says, guys, I want to urge you. <laughs> There's an urgency about the things that I'm about to share <clears throat> with you. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And so we'll just start, uh, stop right there in verse 2. And so Paul says, therefore, and uh, whenever you come across the word, therefore, you should always ask the question, what is this there for? Well, he is speaking, therefore, in reference to the previous 11 chapters <laughs> that he has just written. Therefore, and the previous 11 chapters speak of the gospel and the mercies of God in the life of the believer. And uh, if you remember, part of last week's message focused on the mercy of God. We saw God's mercy to the Jews. We saw God's mercy to the Gentiles. And we saw God's mercy to the entire world. And so Paul starts out saying, Therefore, because of God's mercies. So because of God's mercies, I'm about to instruct you 
in regard to these different spiritual things that should be a part of our lives. It was a motto uh, that 17th century English poet and clergyman George Hebert engraved on his signet ring, and it was the words, less than the least of all God's mercies. I love that. Less than the least of all God's mercies. And it was a phrase in which he signed all of his letters and all of his books. And he got this from Jacob in the Old Testament who had spoken these words as he pondered on God's goodness despite his own sin and shame. And in uh, Genesis 32.10, Jacob says, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. And to that I say, amen and amen. The least of his mercies. Loved ones, let everything begin and end with the mercies of God. And so a living sacrifice, a living uh, sacrificial life, it is not based upon our might, but God's mercies. Let me repeat that. A sac living a sacrificial life is not based upon our might, but God's mercies. And yet, let's be honest, how often do we always try to do things in our own strength, in our own might? But Paul, but Paul is saying that's not how it works. It's not our might. It's God's mercies that should be prevailing. And so again, let us realize that everything begins and ends with the mercy of God. And I like how uh, Peter put this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Let's read this out loud together, shall we? Let's begin. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Wow. Peter is basically teaching us the same thing in his epistle as Paul is here in the book of Romans about being living spiritual sacrifices, not through our own strength, but what? Through Jesus Christ. And it is in light of that mercy that we have to see all of Scripture. It's in light of that mercy that Paul exhorts us, notice, to, in verse 1, present our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. Now, this is worship in its truest form. The song of our lives to God is even more precious than the song of our lips. Don't just give God lip service. Give him life service. Something that is living. Something that is holy. And something that is sacrificial. And the word present it's a picture of actually presenting or offering a sacrifice to God, just like they would in the Old Testament. And that's what we are doing unto the Lord. We are presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice to Him. And He goes on, and it doesn't end there. He goes on and says, and do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed. And this word transformed is the Greek word metamorphosis. I, I, I like the Phillips translation here. It, it's, he, he says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Do you guys feel that sometimes? Sometimes. 
that the world is trying to squeeze you into its mold, that it wants you to conform to its values and its likes and its dislikes and so forth and so on. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. And so Paul, he presents us with a choice here, and that is we can be conformers or we can be transformers. Think about that. We can be conformers or transformers, and this word metamorphosis, it's actually the picture of a caterpillar being transformed into a butterfly. Loved ones, the answer to the world is not a church that looks like the world and thinks like the world and acts like the world, but a church that looks like and thinks like and speaks like and acts like Jesus. You see, a transformed church is the answer to the world's problems. The world won't be changed if the church becomes like the world. And our challenge, though, in Western civilization is that we are content with information well, while God, He desires for our transformation. Oh, how we love knowledge. We, we, we love just to gain and gain and gain more and more knowledge. And we think that information is the answer. But Paul is saying, hey, it's not information that's the answer. It is transformation that is the answer. And notice what happens as transformation occurs. First of all, Paul says that all transformation starts by changing or renewing the way that we think. So uh, transformation starts by changing or renewing the way we think. And so the more we think like Jesus, the more we are going to act like Jesus. And the more we will be able to see life through his eyes and through his perspective. And so renewal in the life of the Christian begins by, here it is, taking on the mind of Christ. And only then will transformation occur. And, and, and guys, that's why some people struggle. And this is why some people remain stagnant in their faith because they never fully embrace the mind of Christ. Instead, they find themselves constantly tempted to conform to the way that the world thinks and what the world values. We conform to culture, rather be transformed into the likeness of Jesus. And therefore, uh, people who struggle with this, their, their lives remain largely unchanged. And so, I want to ask a question. Look at your life over the past year, over the past five years. Has it changed much? Has your spiritual life changed much? If not, let me suggest that we are thinking not according to the mind of Christ, but rather according to the mind of the world. And until we can crucify our mind to the world and begin to take on the mind of Christ, we will remain in this state of struggle. And stagnation. And so notice, once we do this, once we start renewing our mind, notice what happens. Paul says the first thing that is going to happen is that we will prove, or, or literally in the Greek, we will know what the will of God is. And so <laughs> there will be no question in our lives in regard to what God's will is because we will be thinking with the mind of Christ and not a fleshly or worldly mind. And so we're going to know what God's will is. And I've been a pa pastor for, for many years. 
and uh, I've counseled many people and one of the things that people struggle with is knowing what the will of God is. Well, part of the answer to that is renewing our mind. If we take on the mind of Christ, we are going to know and understand what God's will is for us. We will prove or know the will of God. And then Paul gives us <laughs> some indicators when it comes to God's will. If you're ever wondering, is this the will of God? Ask yourself these three questions. Is it good? Is it acceptable? And is it perfect? Let's go ahead and look at that. Is this, is, is this good? Is this acceptable? And is this perfect? And so the will of God is always good. Now, why can I say that with such confidence? Well, because God is good. Jesus referred to himself as the good shepherd. And because God is good, it is God's desire to bring good into the world. And bringing good into the world begins by bringing good into the church, you see which then goes out into the world and touches it with the goodness of God. And that's the difference between a transformed church and a church that is trying to do things in its own strength. You see, we have to be touched by the goodness of God ourselves. And then we can go out and we can reach out and touch the world with the goodness of God. And so, is it good? Number two, is it acceptable? Is it acceptable? Guys, some things are acceptable to God and some things are not acceptable to God. And as Christians, we live to please God, right? What is acceptable to Him should be acceptable to us, and what is unacceptable to Him should be unacceptable to us. Yet, we, we see Christians all the time, and perhaps even we struggle with this, and that is embracing things that the world says is acceptable, but God says is unacceptable. And they not only accept these things, but actually promote them, and, and in some cases actually celebrate the things that, that God says, no, that, that is unacceptable in my sight. That's not acceptable to me, then, then why are you promoting it? Why are we celebrating the things that are not acceptable to the Lord? Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. And there is a very easy way to determine what is acceptable to God and wasn't, what isn't acceptable to God, and that is the Word of God. He lays it all out for us. It covers every area of our lives. And we are given a strong warning by the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 5... Verse 20, he says this. P -p please uh, pay close attention to this. He says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And then verse 21, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. In other words, woe to those who think they know better than God. Woe to us when we think God says this is good and we say, no, that's not good, that's bad. Or God says this is bad and we say, oh, no, 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 that's good. And I'm going to embrace it, I'm going to promote it, and I'm going to celebrate it. And Scripture says, woe. Woe to them. And so, the will of God is always good. 
the will of God must be acceptable to him. And the word acceptable leads us to our next important word, and that is perfect. Good, acceptable, and perfect. And this is where we get the Greek word teleos, which means complete or mature. You see, God's plan is that we grow up in all aspects of our faith. And so if you would, picture a very healthy apple tree that is just full of fruit. Or pick whatever your favorite fruit is that you can embellish at this moment. Whatever your favorite fruit tree is, picture it being full and, and ripe and healthy. Well, that should be reflective of our spiritual lives. That, as Jesus said in John 15, we bear fruit, much fruit, and lasting fruit. We, we shouldn't be like a barren tree that is barely surviving. But to be mature... We have to embrace those things that are acceptable to God. And in the same way, we need to reject the things that are unacceptable to God. And part of being a complete, fully mature Christian is aligning ourselves to the word and the will and the ways of God. And that's also part of that is, uh, is living a, a holy life. Uh, and a sacrificial life as we looked at earlier. And so Paul packs a lot into two verses, doesn't he? And, and we could spend a actually a, a, a lot of time on, on this chapter. Uh, we could be here till 6 o'clock tonight easily. But I've made a commitment. I'm going to stop at 3. <laughs> And so, <laughs> where are you going? Notice what he says in verse 3. He says, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have a sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. And so he is talking here about a measure of faith. He's talking about the grace of God. And in one way, what Paul is doing here is he's, he's joining grace with, with mercy. So he, he, first of all, says, therefore, by the mercies of God, right? So there's the mercy part. And now he joins grace with mercy. And so uh, grace and mercy are eternal pa partners. They, they, they are consistent companion, uh, companions that will never be separated. And we also see that grace and mercy are best experienced in the place of humility. And that's what Paul is saying. By the mercies of God, by the grace of God. But let's not think so highly of ourselves. Why? Because God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so to truly be transformed we requires that we humble ourselves before God and man. And so, do we truly walk in a spirit of humility? Do we mock everyone? Do we mock everything? And to be fully mature, it requires God's grace and mercy to be actively at work in our lives. So, the first part is the mercies of God. Then he introduces the grace of God. And so, he, he, he spends these three verses highlighting this, this spiritual sacrifice that we should be embracing each and every day. Then, in verses 4 through 8, he begins to talk about spiritual gifts. 
Let's look what he has to say there in verse 4. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, and he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now, there are many more spiritual gifts that Paul lists in the scriptures, in the New uh, Testament. Uh, you can find those in 1 Corinthians 12 uh, and Ephesians 4 primarily, and then there's some other uh, gifts that are mentioned along the way as well. But Paul, he chooses to highlight seven spiritual gifts here in Romans chapter 12. And as you look at them, they're basically broken down into two categories, and that is we see speaking gifts... And then we see serving gifts. And the speaking gifts are the gift of prophecy, teaching, leading, and exhortation. And the serving gifts are service, giving, and mercy. And they're all pretty self-explanatory, aren't they? But the primary message that Paul is sending here is that we are all part of a spiritual family that's made up of various members who have been given different gifts. And as such, we all need to play a part in building up and growing the house of God. That's his primary message here. He's not saying that one gift is better than another, that speaking gifts are better than serving gifts. No, he's just saying, hey, we all have gifts and we need to exercise them accordingly, whatever gift they might be. But we see oftentimes that there are way too many people who, who have buried their talents that really they aren't using their spiritual gifts. But loved ones, Paul is reminding us of the immense need of volunteerism in the life and the ministry of the church. Let me say that again. Paul is reminding us of the immense need of volunteerism in the life and ministry of the church and the kingdom of God. So, a question. Has he given you a gift? The answer to that is yes. <laughs> okay? It's not no. If you're a Christian, it's not no or I don't know. But yes. Now, do you know that gift? it's possible that you can say no then, okay? And if you don't know your gift, call the church office and we will provide for you a spiritual gift survey that is very, very accurate that will help you identify your gifts and your passions so that you can begin using those for the king and for his kingdom. And so... Do you have a gift? Do you have talents? Are you using those for the kingdom of God? And so basically what Paul is saying in verses 4 through 8 is church, get engaged and find your place in your spiritual family. Because you're a member of that family and every member has an important place in that family. And that place is not being a bystander or a spectator, but rather actively participating with your grace-given gifts and talents. And you know, I just pray that in every church and in this church, we would all heed Paul's words. That each of us would respond to this challenge and to this instruction to be active in praying for and serving here at AFB. May each one of us 
be great stewards of our time, our talents, and our treasures. And this is what Paul is, is highlighting here. It takes more than just a couple. The 20-80% rule was never designed by God. He wants 100% of us to be involved and engaged in serving and exercising our gifts. And, and part of this word teleos that I mentioned earlier, part of being mature and being grown up requires that we are actively using and investing our gifts for the king and for his kingdom. And so we should all ask ourselves, do I sacrificially give? Do I sacrificially serve? Do I sacrificially uh, invest my time into the church and into the kingdom of God? And Paul gives us some very practical instruction when it comes to that, but it, it begins with an understanding and a vision and even a dream of what a body of believers not only could look like, but should look like. Everyone knowing their own identity. Everyone walking and exercising the gifts that God has blessed them with. And so... Paul, he opens up with talking about spiritual sacrifice. That our lives really should not be uh, complacent or, or content in that manner. But rather we should make sure that we are a living and, and holy exact, uh, sacrifice to God. He then talks about spiritual gifts that each one has that we should be engaged in and exercising. And then the third and the final thing that Paul highlights is spiritual conduct. Spiritual conduct, and we see that in verses 9 through 21. Let's read verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love, and give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in doing so will heap burning coals on his head. Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, I'm not going to expound <coughs> on each of these uh, really commands that Paul gives to us, because they're, they're all pretty self-explanatory, aren't they? We, we don't really need deep interpretation in regard to what Paul is saying here because it's, it's very practical stuff that he's laying down before us. And, and basically, you can look at this and you can just say, well, Paul says what he means and he means what he says. Okay, we, we, there's no secret here, no secret Greek words that we need to discover in order to do these things. They're just very clear practical instruction. And so what I'm going to do is I, I'm just going to paraphrase this in my own words 
to give us a, a little bit more insight, perhaps, in regard to what Paul is writing in these verses. And so you can follow along with me in verse 9. But in verses 9 through 13, Paul is saying, let's not live hypocritical lives. Fair enough, right? Instead of being entertained by evil, let us truly hate what is evil. And let us embrace that which is good. Let love govern our lives and relationships. Let's cultivate a culture of honor amongst ourselves. Let us excel in being diligent in the things of God. Let's be on fire for God, fervent in spirit. And let each and every one of us be involved in some type of service or ministry in the church. He goes on to say, be both joyful and hopeful. Don't give up when things get hard. Be committed to prayer. Help those who are in need and cultivate a culture of hospitality towards each other as well as welcoming those you may not know. And he goes on to say in verses 14 through 21, he says, learn to be a blessing to everyone, even those who persecute you. Be joyful with those who were joyful and learn to cry with others who are overwhelmed with tears. And don't think that you're better than anyone else. And demonstrate this by associating with the outcast and, and the disenfranchised. And just in case you didn't get it the other times I said it, don't think that you're all that. In addition, don't return evil for evil. And walk with respect towards all people. And do everything you can to walk in peace with others. Finally, don't be a vengeful type of person, always seeking payback, but rather understand that God will make sure that they get exactly what they deserve. That's not for you to determine, or as my wife loves to say, stay out of God's business. <laughs> and in closing, Embrace what is good and reject what is evil. Wow. Man, that's a mouthful. That's a couple hands full. That's a, that's a heart full of things that we should be implementing into our lives. What powerful practical and profound instructions that Paul lays out for us regarding our spiritual conduct. Yes, there is spiritual sacrifice that we should all embrace. Yes, there are spiritual gifts that we should all exercise, but we cannot forget that there is spiritual conduct, the practical aspect of living out the gospel that we must also embrace. And, and guys, <laughs> could you imagine if everyone lived by these standards and virtues? Who wouldn't want to attend a church that was made up of Romans chapter 12 Christians? Who wouldn't? Who wouldn't want to associate and be part of a group of people who truly were presenting their, their bodies to the Lord, that they were proving what God's will is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect, who are being renewed by their mind and they're living not lives that are conforming to the world, but are being transformed by the power of God, by, by the way that we take on the mind of, of Christ and a, a, a group of people who all understand that God has gifted them and instead of burying those talents and ignoring those gifts, that we're all exercising them accordingly because you have gifts that I don't have and I have gifts that you don't have. And we all, as members of the body, make that up so that we can fully function as 
a spiritual family, a spiritual house. And then on top of that, we take on these virtues, these characteristics that Paul is laying down in how we should relate to other people, how we should relate to God. Well, <clears throat> in closing, my question, a number of them this morning, is, is loved ones, AFB? My question is, why can't it be us? Why can't we take on these virtues that reflect the nature and the character of God? What's stopping us from being Romans chapter 12 Christians? Why can't we invest our time and our talent and our treasures into the kingdom of God? Is what we are doing in life so important that we can afford to ignore God? And his word. Why can't we live sacrificial lives that bring glory to God and build his church and build his kingdom here on earth? And so that is our challenge. It's our challenge today and it's our challenge every day to be devoted to spiritual things, embracing spiritual sacrifice using our spiritual gifts and taking heed of our spiritual conduct so that we are not just hearers of the word, but actually doers. Would you stand with me? And let's close together in this prayer, shall we? Let's pray this out loud together. Let's begin. Father God, we once again thank you for your mercies. Help us to live sacrificial lives, lives that are good, acceptable, and perfect in your sight. Help us to think like Jesus so that we can have his perspective in all things. And let us serve you with our time, talents, and treasures, leading the virtuous life Paul mentions in Romans chapter 12. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask the elders, the prayer team, to come forward. And if you are in need of prayer for anything, we want to just join with you, call out to heaven, and ask God to meet your need, whatever it might be. It could be health issues, financial issues, relationship issues. Maybe something about this morning's message about living sacrificially or, or actually using your spiritual gifts or, or the spiritual conduct that God has set before us. And, and, and you want to just come and partner with God and, and say, Lord, w w would you enable me to do this for your kingdom and for your glory? Whatever it might be, I would encourage you to come and, and to be prayed with and to be prayed over and should you be here this morning and you don't know Jesus, I, I hope that every Sunday we have lots of people that do not know Jesus. Because He knows you. While you were even in your mother's womb, He knew you and He formed you. And He has a plan and a purpose for your life that can only be discovered when we say no to ourselves and we say yes to Him, we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is when He meets us. That is when He forgives us. And that's when He begins to take us on an amazing journey unlike this world has to offer. If you've never made that commitment, would you come and let one of these prayer you know, servants pray with you, introduce you to Jesus, bring you into the kingdom of God? He loves you so much. Submit your life to him. Give your life to him. He really is a good shepherd, and he will shepherd you along the way. God bless you guys.